Hello and welcome to Pods Above Replacement, part of the Padres Hot Tub Podcast Network. My name is Rafi Cantor. I am the producer of Padres Hot Tub and joining me from the Mile High City, he's just signed an 11-year-long contract to this podcast. It's John Fricota. 11 years? That's what I signed? Oof. Yeah. Have you, are Hope you looking into good. real estate yet? Yeah. Have you, have, you, have you found a house yet? Well, I, I hear that it's going to be a good time to buy soon. So I'll consider it with your 11-year contract offer. I think I'll probably get some real estate. Okay, okay. Uh, well, that's good because uh, you have something in common with the subject of our episode. Uh, you're going to be here for a very long time. Today, we're talking about the X-Man, the final shortstop in the Padres Infinity Gauntlet. It's Xander Bogarts. Uh, so we're going to talk about him. But first, uh, as always, we wanted to plug our YouTube. Hopefully, you're watching this on YouTube, especially for this episode, because we're going to be referencing a ton of data and a, a ton of videos and clips that uh, will be uh, enriched by you seeing it in video form. So we hope you'll join us there. Uh, and of course, we hope you'll join us on the Padres Hot Tub Patreon, patreon.com slash Padres Hot Tub. For as low as $5 a month, you can be a part of our uh, Patreon community. Of course, you get access to the Padres Hot Tub Discord, where you can talk to folks like John and I about what's going on with the team or anything else under the sun. Uh, We'll also get some discounts on merch, free merch. If you go up to the higher levels, free Padres games too. It's all part of the deal. Pod, uh, Patreon.com slash Padres Hot Tub. So uh, really quickly, this is probably our deepest dive that we've done yet on a player uh, who has a ton of question marks surrounding him. And some of those questions, John, we'll be hoping to answer on this episode. That's going to be a good one. I mean, I have seen Xander play plenty of times, but it's nothing in the same realm as we've seen like ha Kim play or Jake Cronenworth play. Um, so it's, it's fun just to learn about a player, see what he's going to contribute. And he is a star player. So it's going to be exciting to see what we purchase for our 11 years, $280 million. So yeah, we're going to be answering a couple questions. Uh, you know, what position should Xander play and was his contract worth it? Uh, so stay tuned for the answer to those questions. But first, let's get to know the man. He hasn't played for us outside of spring training. Uh, we've obviously heard stories from the other side of the country, watching him from afar. But uh, Xander Bogart's born October 1st, 1992. This is going to be his age 30 season. Uh, he was born in San Nicolas, Aruba. I hope I pronounced that correctly, but Aruba's second largest city. And Aruba, of course, being a constituent country of the Kingdom of the Netherlands. Uh, so we saw Xander playing for the Netherlands along with old friend Jerks and Profar in the World Baseball Classic. He signed a 11-year, $280 million contract with the San Diego Padres this offseason that'll see him playing in San Diego through 2033, which is a real year that will happen, uh, <laughs> and is... Uh, Average annual value on that deal is $25.5 million. And those are some big numbers. Uh, those are some potentially scary numbers, depending on your point of view. But when you look at Xander's career, it's easy to understand why someone like AJ Preller would become enamored with him. He's almost a 300 hitter career wise, 292 on base, 356, slugging 458. Uh, and that adds up to a WOBA of 350 and a 118 WRC. Plus. Of course, we talked about. Both of those numbers in our last episode, uh, two episodes ago, against about Trent Grisham, and we'll be talking about them further later on this episode. Uh, and again, you know, those aren't those are those are good numbers. Those are above average numbers. They're not going to absolutely knock your socks off for nearly three hundred million dollars. But you have to remember, this is a player who's playing shortstop, and that's the most premium defensive position in baseball. And uh, an above average bat is going to play uh, with some value there. Uh, that adds up to 34.2 career war so far. Very impressive. And uh, Xander was someone who was kind of uh, coveted from a young age. He was, like we said, playing in Aruba growing up in the Caribbean. Uh, he was signed by the Red Sox as an international free agent uh, August 23rd, 2009. So he was not even 17 years old yet uh, for $410,000. And the... Uh, overriding thought at that time in his life was that he was going to outgrow shortstop you know people saw a, a young man who was growing this is something that we heard about fernando tatis jr at some point too 
um, that we are always going to be too big. He's not going to be able to move around at short. You know, we'll see if that's potentially true. You know, I think none of the pros or the scouts necessarily knew what was in Fernando's future. Uh, but everything that we saw from scouts uh, said that Xander was going to grow out of the shortstop position and move over to third base. Um, I like to look back at some of these scouting reports, not only to see what people were saying about him, but also to see where he was ranked in comparison to some other prospects. So 2012 was this this banner year uh, in the pipeline of MLB where we saw all of the stars of today were really just on the cusp of breaking into the major leagues. So at that time, Xander was the 76th overall prospect. Uh, number six that year was Manny Machado, who's put up 46.6 war so far in his career. Number three was Mike Trout, who has put up 82.1 war in his career. Not bad. Uh, Bryce Harper was number two, who's put up 44.2 war. And the number one overall prospect that year in 2012, Matt Moore. Matt Moore, the uh, pitcher who I believe is now in the Angels organization, uh, who has put up 9.5 war in that time. Matt Moore's had a fine major league career. Uh, you know, he's played in the big leagues for a decade. Um, but I think it's, a, it's great to, to look back at that stuff and just remember, you know, we're, we're just guessing at these points, uh, you know, at, at this time. And Baseball Prospectus at the time uh, said that really assuredly, quote, it's his numbers so far in the minors are good enough to make his eventual move off shortstop fine, which I was like, wow, that is really certain. 2013, the year that he was called up, MLB Pipeline bumped him up to number 20 overall. And uh, same sort of language. Uh, his plus arm works just fine from shortstop. And while he's an average runner, he has better range than one would expect for a player his size. If he has to move over to third, his bat looks like it will play just fine there. Though Will Middlebrooks is standing in the way. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, I have yeah, a couple sorry. points on that. Yeah. <laughs> one, one it, it emphasizes how his arm was a plus arm. And two, it wonders whether... <laughs> he will be able to push Will Middlebrooks off of third. That is <laughs> Padres legend Will Middlebrooks to you, first of oh, all. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, we'll get into talking about Xander's arm a little bit on later in this episode. Um, but really quickly, we're going to kind of just blow through his time in Boston, which was incredibly impressive. In 2013, he's a cup of coffee, 50 plate appearances, you know, just, just, just really coming up and, and seeing what's what. 2014, his rookie season, he's replacement level. Um, he, he would not be a pot above replacement. Uh, he hit 240 <laughs> with 297 on base, 362 slugging, 12 home runs, 294 Woba, 81 WRC plus. So he was Trent Grisham 2022 offensively in his rookie year. So, uh, you know, not something that you want to see from a vaunted prospect. But uh, 2015, his, his sophomore season is really his breakout. He hits 320, which like, I, I don't know why when I read that, I just jumped off the page. 320 with a 355 on base percentage, which is almost impressive that his on base was only 355 while he was hitting 320. Um, he slugged, and he slugged 421. So only seven home runs, but a 338 Woba, uh, 111 WRC plus, and 4.6 war. So that's that's those are all-star levels, no doubt about it. Um, and the rest of the time he's in Boston, he's just a really solid dude. Uh, he doesn't really miss a lot of time. He, he does have injury history, which I'll talk about in a second. But he doesn't miss a lot of time. Uh, his floor, his his worst season after that is 3.1 war, which he'll take from anyone, anytime. And uh, then he has a couple of exceptional years. In 2019, he hits 309, 384 with a 555 slugging, 33 homers, uh, 390 Woba, uh, so a 141 WRC plus, by far and away his best offensive year. And he puts up 5.9 war, comes in fifth place in AL MVP voting. So just... Um, one would think a career year until 2022 comes around his contract year. If you're ever going to have your best year, it might as well be your, your walk year hits 307 with a 377 on base percentage, 456 slugging 366 Woba and a 134 WRC plus with, and this is worth noting because it'll come up later. Good defense, which was the exception. This was the one year that, that Xander Bogart really played a solid shortstop and that gave him enough for 6.1 war, uh, which is his highest war total so that is the uh environment in which xander enters the free agent market i mentioned his injury history he, he never missed significant time his his least games played in a season is 136 games 
Uh, so in 2014, he had a concussion. 2018, he had a, had a small crack in his ankle. And uh, 2022, he got a little bit banked up, banged up as well. He ran into Alex Verdugo during a game. And I only bring this up because there was a sports information science article that Craig Elston of Padres Hot Tub referenced on that show uh, a few weeks ago that you know was talking about Xander potentially being an injury concern uh, this year. And Xander had himself had become aware of that and said, you know, maybe I won't lay out for as many balls. Maybe I won't do this. Maybe I won't do that. So just something to keep your eye on as the, as the year wears on. But we want to dive a little bit further into the numbers and really what makes Xander the player that he is, is, is his offense. So John, uh, I know you were going to talk to us about some of the more elevated stat cast stats that Xander puts up. Yes, I will. And I'm glad that you brought up that article that Craig Elston was mentioning about the diving. I will be bringing that up later on in the episode, but it is an interesting point that we'll get to later. And one more thing. So this this episode, how it's organized, what we're trying to answer is kind of, was he worth the contract? And also, what position should he be playing? And so just so that we're all on a similar level in terms of, is he worth the contract? So we gave him $280 million. I think that a fair valuation would be to say, do we think that he's going to put up about 28 to 35 F4 over the course of his contract, regardless of the years? If they're, you know, he puts up 28 F4 over the next five years or the next 11 years, no matter what, I think that makes him worth the contract that we gave him. You know what I mean? I think that we probably extended it longer than we probably should have in terms of the contract, but that was intentional in order to get the AAV down. So just so that we're all on the same level, the question that I think that we're going to be trying to answer is, do we think that in the next 11 years, he's going to be able to put up about 28 to 35 F war? Um, and thus far in his career, in his nine year career, 2014 to 2022, he has put up 34.2 F war, which is smack dab in the, the, you know, the high end of that range that would make him valuable. So can he replicate the past nine years in terms of value over the next 11 years? Okay, so getting into his, his hitting, um, there was a question that we were trying to answer in this question in this uh, episode, which is how much did Fenway Park playing at Fenway Park play into his success from a hitting perspective, because it seems as though it did a lot. So just to redefine WOBA, we defined it in the past real quick. It's on the same scale as on base percentage. So anything that's a good on base percentage is also a good WOBA. Um, measures home runs as being more valuable than singles and walks is slightly less valuable than singles. So about a 320 is average. 340 is good, 300 is not so good. Now I'm going to define X woba, which is something that we haven't defined so far in this uh, series of episodes. And the difference between X woba and woba is that X woba does not account for actual outcomes. It accounts for walks hit by pitches and then on batted balls that are in play, exit velocity, launch angle, and sprint speed to value what a given contacted ball likely would have produced had it been hit in any ballpark many times. So a thing about Xander Bogarts is that his ex-WOBA, an expected WOBA, is much higher than his WOBA has been, especially at home. And the reason why that might be the case is because he has the giant Fenway wall to the green monster to hit off of. And that's probably something that's accounting for that difference. At home, he hit and a WOBA of 380, 380, which is much, much, much above a 320 average. And his X WOBA was only 336, which is only a little bit above uh, average. Um, still good from a shortstop, especially, but not a 380 that he's been producing, which is, you know, generating his value. However, on the road, his WOBA has only been 335, which measures up with the X WOBA basically perfectly. And his ex woba has also been a little bit lower, 324. So what you're seeing in his career thus far is that he is a slightly above average hitter on the road and a much above average hitter at home. Now, just to put some numbers to that, his, like I said, his ex woba um, 
Second in Major League Baseball since 2015 in terms of the difference between his ex-WOBA and WOBA. So he's dramatically outperforming his batted balls. To the, he's second in the league behind only Nolan Arenado, who played at Coors. And Coors is one of the parks at which you are most likely to have a WOBA that outperforms your ex-WOBA because there's a ton of outfield grass and you're hitting at elevation. So you're hitting a lot of home runs that probably aren't homers in, say, Petco Park. So as an example, Coors Field, an average ex-WOBA is going to be 30 points below their WOBA. And Fen- at Fenway, they're, it's the third uh, most likely to have a better WOBA than ex-WOBA at about 11 points above your average. So it's Coors and then Great American Ballpark and then Fenway. And why I bring this up is because we're trying to answer, is he that 358 WOBA hitter or is he that 330X WOBA hitter? And just to compare some players uh, who we're trying to say he is, a 358 WOBA that he's produced is similar to Manny Machado, who's at 360. Um, Rafael Devers hitting the same at 358. Trey Turner, 359. These are stars. These are superstars in the game. But his ex WOBA is more comparable to, say, Eric Hosmer. 330 was, Wait, <laughs> was Xander's. What? You invoked his name. We have to say know, Beetlejuice three times, otherwise he'll appear. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, if I only say the name once, I think it's fine. So I'll hold off okay. with it one. But the player that shall not be named had a 328 X Woba over the past since 2015. So over the past seven years. And Xander put up a 330. And that's that's dangerously close. I mean, Will Myers was 326. These are these are the kinds of names you compare him to are the player that shall not be named. Will Myers, Aaron Hicks, Mike Moustakis. Cole Calhoun. These are not the the superstars that you think of in terms of baseball compared to his actual output has been sim- more similar to actual superstars. Manny Machado, Reese Hoskins, Trey Turner, Jose Abreu, Rafael Devers. So it's important to wonder which player are we getting? Are we getting a player that's taking advantage of his home environment? Or are we getting a player that is, you know, a superstar or at least a very high quality star, an all-star? And so just, I mean, thinking about that, what, what could he be t- taking advantage in fe- of in Fenway Park? And the obvious answer is he's probably hitting some balls off the green monster that maybe wouldn't be doubles or singles um, at Peco Park. They'd be lazy flyouts. And he is third in the league behind only Mookie Betts and Jose Ramirez, tied with Freddie Freeman since 2015 in doubles th- in the league. And... Fenway Park is the best ballpark in the MLB to hit a double at. In the, in the, since 2015, there has been 70 more f- doubles at Fenway Park than the next highest park, which is Coors Field. Whereas, Petco Park, very hard to hit a double in. We, we discussed this in a previous episode, but there's not a lot of outfield space in Petco Park. So a lot of those balls into the gap are being caught. And so it's actually one of the hardest ballparks at which to hit a double uh, john so i just want to i want to cut in here for a second because i want to i want to make this clear for some listeners think of the square footage of the outfields and when you compare Peco's square footage to fenway it's it's probably not all the difference and I, and I bet you fenway might actually have smaller a smaller outfield but the difference is the green monster any ball you hit off of it is an automatic hit and so even though the the square footage in the outfields might be comparable sizes when you think of something like cores or uh, Oracle in San Francisco, where they have these giant alleys where you can just drop balls into and they're automatic extra bases. Uh, Fenway had the wall. Fenway had the giant, you know, I don't know how tall it is. Uh, someone in the Discord is going to be really mad at me. Uh, but, you know, 30 to 40 foot tall wall. Uh, so just keep that in mind when we're talking about the square footage in the area of the outfield and how that plays into it. So thanks. Yeah, and even even if you don't want to talk about things like square footage, the the fact remains that it's easy to hit a double at Fenway, hard to hit a double in Petco Park. Uh, And we're talking about one of the premier doubles hitters in the game who's now transferring from an easy doubles ballpark to a difficult doubles ballpark, right? And so the question, in my mind, is... What are we getting exactly when we get Xander? There's a huge discrepancy, the, like the most in the league discrepancy over the past seven years in terms of his ex-WOBA versus WOBA. 
are we getting a Manny Machado level player who can play shortstop or at least up the middle? Or are we getting a Will Myers-esque hitter who, yes, he plays shortstop, which is obviously much more valuable than Will Myers, but he's pushing other players down that positional you know, spectrum and therefore making them less valuable. And therefore, he himself is not that valuable. The counter argument to my explanation so far, which has been a little bit bleak, more bleak than I would hope that it would be, um, is that very commonly folks that <laughs> folks that hit at uh, advantageous ballparks tend to be very poor on the road. And when those folks are sent to a more middle ground uh, ballpark, they tend to go somewhere in between their home numbers and their road numbers rather than one or the other, because it is a disadvantage to have a hitting favored ballpark when you go on the road because you're not used to it. The best example is Coors Field. Like imagining having to hit a ball that has ride or rise to it on the road when you just don't see that at Coors Field. It's a huge difference, right? That's just a, a, a huge difference. So every time you go to Petco Park, balls actually have some ride to it where you just don't get that at home. And now you never see that all year. And then suddenly the ball's moving differently. It's a big difference. And it's probably the same thing as with a, like a two-strike approach at Fenway Park. If you know that you can just you know, put your bat on the ball and there's a chance that you knock it off the green, wall, green monster even though you didn't great, get great contact, then your two-strike approach is going to be different on the road. And a good example of that is Mookie Betts, who also had a little bit of a better Woba than X Woba while he played at Fenway. It wasn't as dramatic as Xander's is. It was only like seven points better, whereas Xander's is 44 points better. But when he went to when he went to the Dodgers, he was able to also put up a higher Woba than X Woba, very consistent with his numbers at Fenway and just as a Red Sox in general. So there is a chance that yes, his numbers decline at Petco Park, but not to the dramatic amount that his X Woba would explain. So we'll see. What are your thoughts on that? Um, first of all, I just want to make sure Mookie Betts, he's the bowler, right? He's the guy who's good at bowling. Yeah, he's the That's bowler. That's how I know him. Very okay. good bowler. Okay. I, I didn't realize he also played baseball. Uh, so I have some thoughts. Uh, I am, like most people, on first blush, I get concerned. You know, I, I get concerned, you know, the same same way that you wonder if you sign Trevor Story or Nolan Arenado, like, are they going to hit outside of cores? Are these, are these phantom numbers? Uh, we talk, mentioned Jerks and Profar earlier. A lot of people are saying Jerks and Profar is now taking a one-year deal for the Rockies to go build up his numbers, basically, so that he can try and re-enter the free agent market with these juice stats. Don't know if that's necessarily going to be the case. Uh, first of all, because Jerks and Profar perennially hits 230, and uh, also for the reason that you mentioned, uh, that, you know, Jerkson could play 81 games at Coors and then go on the road and, and just completely flounder. Um, but my feeling about Xander is that he's going to hit less doubles and more dingers. Less doubles, more dingers. And that is the little subheader for this next section of this podcast because uh, Xander, of course, like we said, he's going to see the benefit of hitting basically any deep fly ball to left field off of the green monster in, in Boston. And it's going to be at the very least a single, if not a double. Uh, but he also lost out on line drive home runs that would have been a home run in a lot of ballparks clearing the left field fence that that couldn't clear the green monster. So uh, StatCast has a uh, statistic that is expected home runs. And they break it down by ballpark. And they basically say, okay, you know, Xander Bogarts, He's hit 141 home runs in his career. But if he played all of his games at Fenway Park, they would have expected he actually would have hit 144 home runs. So slightly more. Pretty consistent, you know, pretty close, of course, because he's playing half his games in Fenway. But you go over to Petco Park, and they're saying he actually would have hit 150 home runs, which is a, a pretty big difference. Uh, you know, nine home run difference over the course of his career so far. And so, you know, when I saw that, I was like, okay, that's interesting. That's, that makes me a little hopeful, and, and so I wanted to dig a little bit more into that. And if you're watching on YouTube, we're going to put these, these StatCast illustrators up, so you'll be able to see this. So if you're not watching on YouTube, I encourage you to switch over right now, uh, because right now, here's, here's a map of all of the 
doubles that Xander hit at home from 2020 to 2022. So you can see there's a lot of stuff into the gaps, a lot of stuff, uh, you know, that are down down the foul lines, but a lot that they actually on the map they look like home runs because Statcast sees them and and projects their distance and doesn't know that he's hitting them into the green monster. And so if you were to just isolate some of these doubles and uh, only look at the ones that were fly balls, so no line drives, no stingers off the bat, just fly balls, uh, you can see that, again, a lot of these look like they're home runs because they're all the ones to the left field are off the green monster. And the cool part about StatCast is that you can change the Illustrator background image to any ballpark. So if you look and take Xander's home run, or uh, fly ball fly ball doubles that he hit at home from 2020 to 2022 and convert it to Petco Park, you'll see this graphic, which shows that half of these doubles would have been warning track popouts, which we're very familiar to seeing in, in San Diego with the marine layer and everything. But half of them would have been home runs. So that kind of piqued my interest a little bit. And and so then I was thinking, okay, the left field fence in Boston is very tall. What's that going to cut down on the most? And it's it's line drives. It's it's absolute lasers that we've seen someone like Manny Machado hit uh, frequently into the left field seats, just a ball that is pulled incredibly hard. And so if you look at Xander's home runs that he hit at Fenway during those same three seasons, he hit 30. He hit 30 home runs at home over those three seasons. And of those 30 home runs, one of them, one of them was a line drive. One was a line drive, and it was to the right center field gap. It was an opposite field home run. Now, I mentioned Manny. If you were to compare Manny Machado's line drive home runs to Xander's, um, he hit 45 home runs at home during those same three seasons. And if you were to isolate them to line drive home runs, he's hit 13. So nearly a third of those home runs were line drive home runs, and they were all to left field, left field or left center field. So we're actually opening up an avenue for Xander that he hasn't had at home, which is pulling line drives to left field that clear the fence. It's just something he hasn't been able to do. And so I get the concerns of, oh, are we going to move this guy out of Boston and is he going to be able to hit and do all this stuff? But I actually think that there are some parts of San Diego that are going to greatly benefit his game. And this is one of them. Uh, One of the things we talked about at the beginning of the episode we wanted to break down is what is Xander's contract going to look like? You know, this is an 11-year deal. A lot of things can happen in 11 years. A lot of variants. And uh, the people at Fangraphs, who we owe eternal debt to because we're constantly referencing their data on this episode <laughs> and on all of our episodes, um, you know, Dan Zimborski, he has a projection system called Zips, which is, I'd say, one of the, you know, kind of preeminent projection systems used in, in baseball statistics, uh, you know, very highly regarded. And, you know, his proprietary system projected out Xander's contract and it looks like it's actually going to age extremely well if you trust Zips. And it's not because of his defense, and we'll get there in a second, but it's because of his bat. Um, over the course of his contract, Zips projects him to put up 31.2 total war. And I believe, John, you set the parameters for the beginning of the episode to be between 28 and 35 war. Well, there you go. Right smack in the middle of that, Zips says he's going to put up 31.2 total war. That's uh, an average of just under three war per season, which again, what did I say at the beginning of the episode? If he has a floor of three war, you take that from any player any day. And that's, that's what this contact sort of says that over the course of it, he's going to put up just under three war, which sees us paying just under $9 million per win over the course of this deal. And that is about what wins go for these days. It might even be a little bit of a discount given the crazy free agency that we've had this year. Um, when you compare those numbers to Manny Machado and his 11 year, $350 million extension, it starts to look a lot worse. Manny's deal projects according to the same projection system zips that he's going to put up 20.6 total war over the course of that deal. That is a full win 
per year below what Xander is projected. And that sees us roughly paying $17 million per win. And that's a lot of money. That is a huge premium that we would be paying for Manny's production. And whereas Xander is projected to be above a replacement level the entire deal, Manny around year seven to eight starts to dip below one war and by the end of the deal is actually projected to be below replacement value. And that is largely due to Zip seeing his bat drop off. And John, I know uh, you had some thoughts about why Manny might project to be a little bit poorer than Xander. It's super interesting comparing those two players who are about the same age, uh, similar outlook in terms of like what you would expect from them from the bat and also in the field. Uh, had you put Xander at a lower level position than shortstop. When you look at the actual numbers, it, actually suggests that Manny Machado is more likely to have a good glove throughout his contract, or at least not fall off to quite the extent that Xander falls off in terms of defensive value. The thing that they say in these proprietary uh, projections is that Manny is more likely to fall off from a bat standpoint than Xander is. They suggest that Manny is going to have a higher value at the plate over the next few years, but then drop off more precipitously, whereas Xander's pretty much above average for the first many years and then about average at tor- even towards the end of the contract when he's approaching his 40s. I don't know why that suggests that he is more likely to have a good bat than Manny Machado over the course of that contract. To me, it makes less sense. One of the things that is most suggestive that you are going to struggle in your older age is when you don't have a lot of bat speed and you're coming out with a YouTube short. I suggest everybody come to our YouTube channel and watch the YouTube short because we're going to be releasing one minute uh, analysis of different things. And one of the things that we're going to talk about is Manny Machado and his bat speed because his bat speed has been noticed to be amongst the best in the league. And we're going to break that down, why that is and how it contributes to him as a player overall. But if you have a preeminent bat speed like Manny Machado does, when he ages, even if his bat speed starts to fall off, he's still going to be able to hit the fastball and people aren't going to be able to overpower him. Even as things, you know, get worse and worse. Xander's not quite the same player. We don't have data on him compared to Manny, but Manny is literally one of the league leaders in bat speed. So I don't know why he's, he is suggested through these you know proprietary projection systems to fall off more towards the end of his contract at the plate. But that's, that's basically the difference that they suggest is that Xander is more likely to continue having a league average or better bat basically for 10, 11 years, whereas Manny is more likely to have a good bat for five years and then fall off afterwards. Well, you mentioned their defense and we got to settle in folks. Cause this is going to be a sobering com- conversation. I hope you're enjoying that stiff drink. Hopefully John, because this is not going to I be, <laughs> I, this is not going to be fun. Uh, because I knew when we started researching this episode that people were concerned about Xander's defense and like, Oh, is he going to stick a short stop? Whatever. And I was like, how bad could it be? And then I looked. And it's it's bad. It's bad, John. It's 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 really bad. <laughs> uh over his career, uh, you know, we talked about in our Trent Christian Maver- er, episode, outs above average. Uh, you know, it's kind of the preeminent defensive statistic used in Statcast these days. It's really fun. It's a cumulative stat. It basically says, How much better or worse than average is this person at their position? And over the course of seven seasons, again, one of them is a COVID season, so it's a little shortened, Xander has amassed 35 outs below average, 35 outs below average in his career. Um, and he varies a lot year to year, but um, he's only had two years that are above average. Uh, and one of them was his most recent season. So we talked about his most recent year being his contract year, putting up 6.1 F4 
you know, it wasn't his best offensive season. It's actually that he was having a really good offensive season in combination with not being a total zero on the field. Um, so he put up six above, outs above average last year. So that negates, obviously, the damage that he'd done earlier in his career, which is good, but it's only 14th out of 37 qualified shortstops. So it's, it's above average by definition, but it's only slightly above average. And one of the things that I thought was super interesting about his defense last year is that he had eight outs above average against lefties and negative two outs above average against righties, which is consistent with his career, uh, which is that he's, he's played better defense when a lefty is at the plate than when a righty is at the plate. But what's different about that is that that's actually the opposite of almost every other shortstop in Major League Baseball. And it, it, when you think about it for a second, it makes sense. There are more righty hitters than lefty hitters, and outs above average is a cumulative stat. So if you're a good defender, you're going to put up and you know, you know, earn more outs above average uh, against righties just by virtue of the fact that there are more righties than lefties. And so for there to be such a stark difference between the two where he's put up seven outs above average in his career against lefties and negative 42 against righties. Jesus. It's it's super interesting. And you have to start and think about why that might be. Um, the first thing that comes to my mind is the shift. You're shifting more against lefties. And so it's, it was much more likely before now that Xander was playing on the right side of the second base bag when lefties were at the plate, which would uh, negate one of his uh worst attributes on the field which is his arm you know we, uh, we you mentioned it when we were talking about the scouting reports but xander has a weak arm he uh his his arm i don't know why i can't talk right now his throw speed <laughs> has been uh what, clocked at 80 yeah i don't know whatever, whatever you want to say his throw speed his arm you know his ball fastness uh has been clocked at 82.1 82.1 miles an hour last year for shortstops. That's 34th out of 50 qualified shortstops. So when you think about that, it kind of makes sense why he's not converting opportunities against righties. Number one, he has a negative 26 career outs above average moving to the third base side. So moving to his right. And what do you need to make those plays? You need a strong arm. You're going to be planting your back foot and firing off of it. It's what we think about when we think about Manny. And, and, when he was playing shortstop, it's what we thought about when Fernando Tatis was playing shortstop. He has a cannon, okay? Xander doesn't have that. So when he was moving to his left or when he was shifted against lefties, he had a much higher conversion rate and was putting out, you know, putting up decent defensive numbers. And for fun, I thought we should compare Xander Bogarts and the person whose job he took, Ha Sung Kim. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, this would be ha Sung Kim's position if we hadn't gone out and signed Xander. And even, you know, before Bob Melvin and AJ Preller said that Xander Bogarts was going to be the starting shortstop for the Padres, it was kind of a question of like, can we move this dude, ha Sung Kim, off of shortstop? He was lights out last year. So um, ha Sung Kim, when looking at his outs above average statistics, he is either average or above average moving in every direction, which if you've watched him play matches the eye test, which is that the dude's just solid. You know, he, he was never making the air Tatis jump 5,000 feet in the air type of plays, but he was really consistent, uh, rarely making errors. And his arm strength is 87.1 miles per hour, which compared to Xander is five ticks fully above Xander. It's eighth in Major League Baseball for shortstops. So compare that to Xander, who was 34th. So on a, um, like we said, outs above average, cumulative stat. The longer you play, the better defense you play, the more it adds up. So Hassan Kim, so far between 2021 and 2022, he had 647 plays, 647 attempts to play the ball, balls that were hit in his direction. Xander has had 1,137, so almost double. So I want everyone to bear with me for a second, but it's tough to compare outs above average when you have someone who's, who's played twice as much because they're going to have twice as many opportunities to make these plays. So 
what I was able to do was figure out on a rate basis how many outs above average per attempt are these guys putting up. And again, it takes a while to accrue an out above average. So these numbers are really small. But when you start to lay them out, they start to paint a really clear picture. So uh, Xander, excuse me, Hassan Kim has converted 10 outs above average on those 647 attempts. That's 0.01545 outs above average. Okay. Xander converted negative five outs above average on those 1,137 attempts. That's negative 0.0044 outs above average. Those two numbers, you don't need to remember. You can, you can throw them out of your brain right now. What's important is the difference between the two of them. The difference between the two of them is 0.1985 outs above average. Okay? So that means on, you know, per attempt, that is the difference between those two players is almost uh, a fifth of an out above average. So over the course of a season, this is where things start to become clear. About 550 attempts, similar to plate appearances, you know, 500, 600, something in that range. That's about a full season of attempts in the field. And if you were to take that, that difference between the two players, that's almost 11 outs above average, 10.92 outs above average. And according to StatCast, that's roughly 8.19 runs prevented. So eight, over eight runs prevented over the course of a season from having ha Kim at shortstop over Xander. Now, okay, eight runs, big deal, whatever. You know what I mean? Why, why, why does that matter? Well, one of the great things about sabermetrics is that Early on, people, you know, kind of figured out you need to score runs to win. And people were able to calculate over the course of a season, the number varies from year to year, but how many runs a team needs per win. You know, just a really simple idea, runs per win. And in 2022, runs per win was equal to 9.524. So when you compare those two numbers, the runs per win in 2022 and the runs prevented by having ha Sung Kim at shortstop over Xander, it's almost a full win different. Eight, it's a, a 0.86 wins. So now these numbers start to become a little bit more real and a little bit more scary, if I'm being completely honest. Because what if it's a tight playoff race and... The Padres and the Dodgers are going at it and there's, you know, a chance to to win the division and the difference is one win. And Xander's been playing at shortstop that entire year. You're you you know and it is playing a, a weaker defense. This is kind of an oversimplification of course, but it's the way that I know that front offices and stat heads and everything they think about these things. They think about baseball in terms of scarce resources. And the scarce resources in baseball are wins and outs. And, you know, what these numbers show us is that Hassan Kim has a better chance of putting up outs, making outs, and a better chance of helping the Padres win when, they're, when he's playing at shortstop. Um, really quickly, before I kick it back over to John, uh, we talked about projection systems and zips and value from each player playing in their respective positions. Uh, Zips depth charts, which is another fan graph system, which is basically the, a combination of their two most powerful projection systems, um, kind of implies through their projections that it's going to cost Hustle Kim 0.4 F4 to move from shortstop to second base. And the reason's very simple. His defense is less valuable at second and his bat is less valuable when he's at second because... Then with the numbers he's putting up, it's more valuable if a shortstop is hitting that well than a, than a second baseman. Talked about this in the Jake Cronenworth episode. Going to cost Jake Cronenworth 1.2 F4 to move from second base to first base because his bat, which is great for a second baseman, is kind of fine for a first baseman, right? You add up those two numbers, that's 1.6 F4 in value that you're projected to lose. Now. Xander Bogarts is projected to put up 4.5 F4 this year. Okay. Hassan Kim 
if he had stuck at shortstop, was projected to put up 3.4. So now we're thinking about things in terms of replacement, okay? If you're substituting Xander for ha Sung Kim, that's a difference of 1.1 war, okay? That's great. That's great to add up and, 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 and get another win. But the question is, at what cost? At what cost are you doing it? For the Padres, it's costing $25 million more, at least, plus potential downstream effects of moving Hassan Kim from shortstop to second and Jacob Cronenworth from second base to first base. So with all that in mind, John, I know you have some thoughts about that move. Sorry for the NorCal vernacular on a San Diego Padres podcast, but that is some hella good information you just put forth. So I- exchanging Xander for Ha Sung just at shortstop is basically worth a war, a like 1.0 F war, very close to it. And that's taking out all the extra variables, which are pushing Ha Sung Kim and Jay Cronenworth down the position scale and costing them value, as well as, I would venture, taking away Xander's own value, which I will now argue is much higher at second base than it would be at shortstop. So that's two things. That's not only our, is our shortstop value going down by exchanging ha Sung Kim for Xander Bogarts, but also... Xander Bogart's value would be higher at shortstop, which we are now getting rid of, right? And so let me, let me make this argument. So you said that Xander has been worth six outs above average last year. And that's true. When Fangraphs breaks this down based on how many outs above average he was, depending on where he was lined up, he was worth five of those six outs above average when lined up in what is a prototypical second base position based on the shift, (laughs) which, which you were saying your argument was that, you know, he's better against left-handed hitters. Why? Because he's basically a second baseman against left-handed hitters. That's all his value. He, you know, he had negative one war from the shortstop position. And then he had one war when he was playing third base in very few attempts, but I mean, sorry, not one war, one OAA. And so essentially he's a below average shortstop actually a very much below average shortstop and then he's a great second baseman from the data that we have available so far and you can say okay yes but he is a shortstop and as soon as you move him down to a less valuable position like second base suddenly he's not as valuable as he was before and i would say that's not true and we have examples of scenarios in which that was not true because when you have a shortstop who is not a shortstop playing shortstop it costs you more value than it would like it would cost you if you had that player playing the position in which he should probably be playing. And a great example is Marcus Simeon. So I'll use Marcus Simeon as my example. Starling Castro is also a good example, but in order to like prove the point, I will use Marcus Simeon. Okay. So Marcus Simeon, very similar player. Both of them had below average outs above average for the most of their career. Simeon before he Switch to second base was a 19th percentile second baseman or shortstop in 2019, and then a first percentile in 2020. And then as soon as he moves over to second base, where his weak arm is not as much of a you know problem, especially deep in the hole, he moves up to a 90th percentile outs above average defender. Last year he was even better at 94th percentile. Xander is basically the same player. He's had you know, at the same timeline, he was the 25th percentile defender at shortstop, 4th percentile, 13th percentile, 1st percentile, one of the worst shortstops in the game. And then last year, he had his 88th percentile defensive season, which we're all excited about. But most of that was just him playing second base in the shift, like most of his value. In fact, almost all of his value. He is also very very similar in terms of arm strength. He has been around the 15th percentile the whole time. So was Marcus Simeon before he went over to second base. And so Marcus Simeon, during the same period of time, actually had his value go up when he went to a less valuable position because he was playing that position very well. And his bat stayed you know, similar in terms of quality. If you had Xander playing at a Marcus Simeon level defense at second base, which I think that that's basically a floor for what I would expect from him. 
I think that he will be able to catch all the balls going his way and his arm will be strong enough to get outs that he would need to have. If you average like his hitting with Marcus Simeon level defense, then he is a four plus war player, pretty standard. And he can get into that six, six plus war just by having a you know, relatively good year for him. However, if you keep him at shortstop when he is not a shortstop and we are not, not allowing the shift anymore, and now, you know, Hassan Kim went down a level, Jake Cronenworth went down a level, Xander is not playing shortstop very well, it's pretty obvious that you're losing value for what I would assume is an ego-type conversation. It's the wrong decision, I think. I, I, don't, I don't know how the numbers could say anything otherwise. Like, he, he has more value potentiality playing second base with Hassan and Kim at shortstop than vice versa. Not only that, but it's not like moving him down the positional totem pole is not going to cost him value. It should, in fact, increase his value because his skill set is perfectly suited to the position. What do you think? Um, honestly, I've gotten really mad over the course of this episode. Like I, yeah, and like, yeah, I, 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 it's like kind of, I was like, oh, haha, but like, I'm like actually kind of upset. And the reason is kind of like what you said, this is seemingly an ego move. And the narrative that we've had about the Padres coming out of spring training has been Everyone's bought in. Everyone's bought into the process. We've got Nelly here on a $1 million deal. We've got Matt Carpenter here, you know, trying to get that next ring. And we've got Tatis moving to right field because whatever he needs to do to get to get back in the good graces of everyone and, and, you know, help his team and do all this stuff. And yet this move is completely counter to all of that, that entire narrative, because we're actively hurting the Padres by doing this. And I, I understand the advantage that the Padres, and I commend the Padres and AJ Preller and Peter Seiler for trying to effectively be the most player friendly front office in baseball. You know, that is their that is the new market inefficiency is spending money and and treating people well. Like crazy idea <laughs> that if you if you you know treat labor with respect, it will pay you dividends potentially. We will see. But crazy um and yet baseball is an incredibly studied game we know so much about the sport and we're learning more every year and and defense is this next thing that you know we have offense pretty much down and defense the statistics are are still kind of being flushed out a little bit but i i don't know man it's like it's really it's really upsetting and and uh you know this is these little things around the margins matter and count. And I think the thing that, especially if Xander does what he says and he's going to be diving a little bit less and, and, and you know, in the name of, of staying healthy, the thing about defense is that sometimes you never actually are able to see what never happened because that person was not in a starting position to lay out for that ball to make it happen in the first place. So sometimes a ball makes it through the 5.5 hole or it goes right down, you know, right over the second base bag. And it's easy to think, oh, you never would have gotten there. But maybe Hustle and Kim would have. You know what I mean? And it's like, it's it's so much less visceral than seeing a strikeout or something where it's like, it's a zero or a one. Did they hit it or not? You know what I mean? It's like, oh, maybe they could have gotten there. And this is something that we won't know immediately. You know, I'm sure Xander will make some error and everyone will overreact early on and, and say it's indicative of, of some terrible defense. But it will be something we can look back on in November and say, did the Padres make the right decision or not? So uh, I, I think, you know, we, we wanted to answer two questions in this show. Where should Xander play? Do you buy or sell his contract? It seems like we're both in, uh, you know, vehement <laughs> agreement <laughs> that he should be a second <laughs> baseman. That Hassan Kim should be playing yeah, shortstop. Can I just bring up yeah. one thing? Yeah. So you you were bringing up the Bill James reference, which I said that I was going to talk about, and I forgot to. But I think that it is important to notice that the Bill James handbook, the thing that they were referencing, was this. It was that since the year 2021, 
Bogarts has the second highest number of sliding, diving, and jumping plays with 150. He has recorded 10 outs in his last 72 dives. And he referenced having heard of that statistic and maybe he should dive fewer times for balls to his left or right. Which would, to me, only assume that his defensive value would go down, not up. But also, some of those plays probably would be outs if he were playing at second base. The, the, probably the reason why he's only had 10 outs in 72 dives is because he has very poor arm strength. And if you have to dive for a ball and throw it to first, you're much more likely to dive for a ball and throw someone out at second base than you are at shortstop. So just saying, like, we, we, we talk about maybe his value is better at second base, but also maybe his injury likelihood is better at second base, which obviously can be much more valuable than we're saying. So, yeah, so sorry. You bring it up the question, should he play second base? We're agreeing. Yes, he should play second base. So, but he's not. At, at the very least, in 2023, he's going to be the Padre shortstop. So, with that in mind, I guess we should take this question in two parts. You know, would you buy or sell Xander Bogarts' contract with the Padres? And let's take the first part as he's going to be shortstop for that entirety, for the entirety of that deal. And we're just going to bake that into the assumption. And then the second part will say he could potentially move off of the position after this season. You know, that, that you know, maybe he's receptive to the data and, and et cetera, et cetera. So, so let's, let's start with the first part. Assuming Xander Bogarts is playing shortstop for 11 years for the Padres, are you buying or selling this deal? Assuming he's playing shortstop, selling the deal. $280 million. Can he put up 30 plus uh, 28 to 35 war? At shortstop, I think it will be very difficult for him to put up 28 to 35 F war at shortstop for 11 years. Uh, I'm going to agree with you on this one. And uh, it's actually, I'm, I was a little more torn because, again, I'm like really intrigued by this bat that's apparently going to age like fine wine and not, you know, not let <laughs> up in the same way that, that Manny's is. But you have to think about the opportunity cost in the system right now as well because we have a shortstop who might be the top prospect in baseball by the end of the season, the way that people are talking, in Jackson Merrill. And because Jackson Merrill is now effectively, uh, in the same way that Xander Bogarts was blocked by one Will Middlebrooks uh, not a decade ago, <laughs> Jackson Merrill is theoretically blocked by Xander Bogarts to play shortstop. Now, you know, could Jackson Merrill come and play second base after Hassan and Kim leaves? Absolutely. Could he play shortstop after Xander, you know, comes to his senses and moves to second base? That is also a possibility. But right now, just looking at the opportunity cost, you have a player who is vaunted, who is going to be on a rookie minimum deal and then arbitration for three years after that. And, you know, is not going to cost you twenty five and a half million dollars a year. So uh, we're both in agreement. We're going to sell this deal if he sticks at shortstop for a decade plus. If Xander Bogarts is potentially interested in moving after this season are you buying or selling this deal at second base playing at marcus simian levels which i think that he can play at i think that he could put up 30 or more f4 i think that it's reasonable i think that when you're paying near the cap all you really need to do in free agency is pay the money that players are worth and your team will be good like if you're paying as much as we are paying and everybody is playing as well as you are paying them, you're going to have a playoff to championship level season almost every season. So it's like, as long as we're not getting ripped off in this deal, then it's a pretty good deal. It's kind of foolproof, right? AJ Preller can't make a lot of errors when he has Soto, Tatis, Manny Machado, and Xander on his roster. It's like, that's already just those four and replacement level everywhere else is a decent team. So it's kind of foolproof. And I, I understand that level of thinking. And I think that that's a fair way to, you know, put out your money, especially when you have a GM who is known to be a prospect gatherer. Like if, if we continue to supplement our, our farm system while having these solid players littered throughout our roster, then we're just going to be good for a long time. And so I understand that contract from that perspective. It's probably overpaying just a little bit still relative to market rates, but relative to him putting up, you know, 30-ish war over the next 11 seasons, I think he can approach it or, or 
very possibly go over it. So I don't think it's a bad deal if we're going to use him how I think that he is most valuable, which we're not currently doing. Yeah. Xander Bogart in a vacuum, I think, is, is, is worth this money, or at the very least, it's not a bad deal. So, and I think, especially when you're signing superstars, um, they don't necessarily have to out, outplay the value of their contract. If they live up to their contract, that's a success because you've gotten all these other ancillary benefits of them being there. It's, first of all, it's hard to uh, play up to a free agent contract in general. Like typically teams are, are buying decreasing production unless you have a player like Manny or like Juan Soto, hopefully not, who's hitting free agency at a young age. OK, and they're, they're going to hit their prime and, and, and do, all, do that whole thing. So. It's hard for a player to play up to their contract, so if someone does and again, it's like because the Padres are now going to sell more season tickets, which has proven to be true and are going to sell more jerseys and they're going to extend their reach into Aruba and the Netherlands and like all these other places just by having Xander on the team and they're going to bring over more bandwagon fans you know if the Red Sox aren't competitive this year they might think oh I want to root for you know Xander he's going to be they're going to be my NL team now you know it's like these are all things that come from signing a star so I in a vacuum I don't think it's a bad deal and for by also by all accounts, like this is not something we talk about on this show because this is a stats show. But he seems like a good guy, and people in Boston like <laughs> really, people in Boston really love him and are like we're like viscerally upset by his departure. So I am so thrilled to have someone like Xander on the team, and I think it's possible that if he is uh, a bit more malleable during his time in San Diego, that. This contract is worth it. So, <laughs> what an episode. All right. We really, like, we talked about our feelings. Like, this is great. <laughs> um, so, thanks again, everyone, for listening to Pods of Replacement. Uh, John, do you have any parting thoughts before we wrap this thing up? No, but I am excited about where we're going in terms of YouTube content. I think that we're going to hit up the the shorts a little bit more. It makes for, like, really quick analysis that's that's. I, I would think it's valuable. I hope it's valuable. Um, so if you guys wanted to check us out, we're going to be hopefully gaining some steam in that on that front. Yeah, and just to echo what John is saying, like we are in the nascent stages of this. This is our fourth episode. Uh, you know, we hope you're listening to this soon, but we also hope that you're listening to this weeks or months from now. That's part of the reason we wanted to do this show is that you know we're doing these deep dives into players that that are theoretically you know you can listen to them whenever, but. We want to hear from you, you know, comment on YouTube. Hopefully you watch this on YouTube so you can check out those sick videos that we posted and the data uh, that we posted as well. Uh, You know, if you're on the Discord, again, you can join the Discord just as low as $5 a month, patreon.com slash Padres Hot Tub. You know, we have a a channel on our Discord dedicated just to the show, Pods Above Replacement. And John and I are in there all the time and we're talking to folks and, you know, people are giving us their thoughts and we really appreciate it. And, uh, you know, we've had some shout outs from some other Padres podcasts. We appreciate them too. And, uh, you know, listening. So, uh, we're still trying to find our feet. So bear with us and, and let us know what you think. Cause we'd love to hear from you. So once again, uh, this has been an episode of pods above replacement. Uh, tomorrow is opening day when this episode comes out. Hopefully it's, 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 uh, hopefully it's dry. Hopefully we get a game on time, but <laughs> I'm so excited for this, for the season. And I'm so excited to be looking at it with you, John, because this has been uh, a really fun few, uh, first four episodes, and I think we're only going up from here. So uh, thanks, everyone, for listening. Pods Above Replacement will be back next week with a new episode. Until then, subscribe to us on YouTube, subscribe to our podcast feed, and uh, we'll see you guys next time.